So hi, welcome. I am so glad to have Linda Borski here from Saskatoon Physio Yoga um, here on the uh, Focus Forward Business Podcast. I'm Sturdy McKee, business coach and advisor and your host for the podcast. Um, thank you very much for being here, Linda. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on, Sturdy. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, Linda's a, a former client and um, kind of in the alumni group now, but um, I mentioned Saskatoon Physio Yoga, but tell, tell our listeners a little bit more about who you are and what you do, please. Okay, um, I'm a physio by trade, but um, a little bit kind of expanded role into a medical yoga therapist as well. And so that's taking um, the healing arts of, of uh, yoga therapy and bringing them in and blending them into the physiotherapy treatment room or now I've got a studio too. So we'll teach classes and whatnot. Um, I started my business, I started Saskatoon Physio Yoga when I was working for somebody else. And that was in about 2014 when I kind of dove into that piece of the training. And, and in 2016, I opened my own space called Saskatoon Physio Yoga. So brick and Was that your first business? Um, not exactly. I <laughs> had... <laughs> Um, never really thought of myself as a business owner, but when I kind of look back, it's kind of like, yeah, you've had a business for a long time, Linda. Um, I grew up, uh, one of the, one of my primary sport growing up was figure skating and, and those who don't compete really well, um, are often, um, ushered into the coaching side of things. So at age 12, I was identified as a coach no. <laughs> and not as a competitor. <laughs> um, and, and so I started teaching figure skating to little kids at age 12. And, and then that turned into a professional a paid figure skating coach and then coaching um, power skating, which is skating skills to hockey players. Mm -hmm. um, by the time I was in my late teens and I did that right up until last year. So oh, really? I kind of had, yeah, I had that power skating business going. Okay. So, well, that's kind of, I yeah, I mean, I like how you got into it in the first place. Um, so when you, you started that and when you started Saskatoon Physio Yoga, do you wish you had done it at all differently in the beginning? You know, as far as a clinic owner goes, I never ever saw myself as a clinic owner, right? Um, my parents owned a jewelry store in a small rural city in Saskatchewan, and I saw dad working nine till six, coming home for supper and nap on the couch, going back to work at eight o'clock. You know, and I'd see him the next day at supper time. So, I re, I just remember business ownership as as being a lot of tough, struggling kinds of things, and and that's what I took forward from mom and dad's business. Um, and it wasn't until he retired, and and unfortunately he passed away shortly after retirement. But it was at that point that I kind of said, hey, actually financially he did really well but even so I wasn't motivated to to um to open my own clinic at all through physio school or even the first 10, 15 years of my physio career um so yeah, why just, did you what what kind of what was the catalyst for that the catalyst was oddly enough I had nowhere else to go <laughs> <laughs> okay so when I started Saskatoon Physio Yoga, I was working for another small independent practitioner, um, business owner, and he was very supportive, but we couldn't have been further apart on the treatment philosophies um, mm -hmm. between him and I. And, and although he said, yeah, do whatever you want, there wasn't a really great place for me to grow there. And so then I moved my practice to a Pilates business with the thought of aligning with this Pilates business and and being able to grow a practice and and the yoga therapy the medical yoga therapy side or the physio yoga side of things within that space and um, it became really apparent really quickly that I wasn't going to be able to 
grow into what I thought I could there. Um, so that's why I say I really had nowhere else to go because I thought if I can't take my yoga therapy and physiotherapy practice into a Pilates studio, then I don't think there's any place that I could thrive with that. And so I ended up finding a space and opening up. So, I mean, you, you do a lot of things in your business. Maybe, uh, I guess, before we go into the next kind of question question, I would love for you to explain a little bit more about what your business is, because you got a couple of component parts to it. Sure. Um, when we first opened, I used to joke, I said, we're physiotherapy by day and yoga therapy by night. Because um, <laughs> okay. we, we had, you know, the basis of our practice, of my practice and my business was physiotherapy offering yoga therapy. So we did traditional one-on-one -on -one physical therapy types of, of treatments. It was one-on-one -on -one treatment. It was, you know, looking after sports injuries and um, medical conditions, work injuries, motor vehicle accident injuries, you know, your typical primary kind of physiotherapy stuff. But alongside that, I, I, I wanted to teach physio yoga classes. And so that's where the space opened up. And then it was kind of like, okay, so now we're taking what I, what I love to do and what I have been doing in a one-on-one -on -one treatment space and offering it to initially four people at a time and then six mm -hmm. people at a time and then 10 people at a time. And why did you, what, what, what made you want to start teaching classes? Um, remember that little tidbit about me teaching power skating that I mentioned yeah. just a little bit ago? Yeah. Um, I was always really picky about how I taught power skating and I wanted to be real. There were a lot of programs out there that put 30 kids on the ice, had one main instructor, um, a couple of, you know, assistant coaches who I basically said pushed pucks and pylons around and didn't really do anything. And, and it turned to me, when I looked at those types of programs, they were kind of like a really great activity, um, burned up a lot of energy, but the quality of instruction wasn't there. There were too many kids on the ice, um, you know, 30 kids to one instructor, or maybe, you know, one instructor and two, two assistants, just, it didn't get the teaching part of things across. Mm -hmm. And so I found the same thing in the yoga world. I'd go into a community association class or um, a yoga studio class, and there would be 20 people there. And sometimes there was really talented teachers at the front, unable to give any type of personalized instruction because they were simply outnumbered. Too many right? people, right. Yeah, there was just too many people. And, and then there's the physio. So there's that, I wanted, I wanted to offer quality teaching, but then there's the physio side too. And it's kind of like, you know, how as, um, as physios, we're kind of always critiquing, you know, if we're in a gym and stuff, we're always looking at. <laughs> Never done at, that. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we're also, Driving down the oh, road. Man. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. You're just kind of like, oh man, if you continue doing squats that way, you're going to just <laughs> Blow out those knees. It's good. Anyway, I was I found myself doing that in in yoga classes as well, and so I thought, you know what? Here's my opportunity to shift that, provide some really great quality instruction from the yoga world, and bring that bring that into the physio yoga piece. Okay, cool. Um, so, what advice would we we'll always ask some, something about time management? What advice would you give a business owner who's kind of struggling? With not having enough time. You know what? One of the key things uh, for me has been uh, meditation. Really? Yeah. And meditation um, is one of those practices that it, it occurs for me, you know, every day, all every day. Um, and it just really sets me up. It, I find that it really gives me clarity. It can help me with focus. 
Um, it can help me solve some problems by bringing that clarity and focus around. So from a time management perspective, I know that if I don't meditate first thing in the morning and, and as part of my morning routine, then it's kind of like, yeah, the day just doesn't flow like it normally would. Okay. Um, so it's a really good thing to get me, it gets me started off on the right foot every day. Cool. Well, thanks yeah. for sharing that. Um, so another thing, I mean, you've been doing this for a little while now. Um, I talk to people who have been in business for 30 years, for you know a year. Uh, everybody thinks their challenges are unique. What I get to see is that <laughs> it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it, there are still new challenges and, and problems that you're facing and stuff. So what challenges are you kind of focused on or dealing with currently in your business? Currently, um, growth right now. So okay. I think um, right now, and I just, I just like 30 minutes ago came from a staff meeting and I said, okay, you know what? We've gotten through the first seven months of this pandemic thing. Um, it's, it's time to stop reacting it's start, time to start being proactive and let's focus shift, shifting our focus from surviving mm -hmm. <laughs> the pandemic to how can we actually accept what's going on and grow despite the pandemic that's going on. So and what are you doing to, what are you doing along those lines? Along those lines, I hired a new therapist. Mm -hmm. So I have the most therapists that I've um, ever had in my business currently and I'm adding another one um, in the new year so Great. yeah so now I have to find patience and right. <laughs> for those people and and move forward so that's my growth opportunity is because now that I have more clinicians we've got more opportunity to serve more people cool cool thank you um, so what's your proudest moment in business so far hmm Good question. Yeah, there was, um, I think one of the big mind shifts that I've had was when I was, I was an employee and I told you this story a little while ago, Sturdy. It was kind of like, I was part of a, a corporate physio clinic and there was 30 people or so on staff and the management came into a staff meeting and said, we're gonna talk about core values. We need core values in here. And we'd all been operating there for a number of years. Um, the business had been in place for a couple of, well, at least one decade, probably 15 years by that time. And I had been, anyway, it just, it, the whole process rang really hollow. To I thought, yeah. oh my, looking back, I was, I was one of those employees where I don't think there was anyone who was more disengaged with that whole process than myself. And I'm a little embarrassed to admit that because right now, um, with Saskatoon Physio Yoga, I rely so heavily on our core values and, and probably being able to say not only these are our five core values and this is what it means and here's examples of them, but actually to be able to discuss with my staff every week examples of how we as individuals, how we as teammates, uh, how we as a business, um, uh, lived those core values. Uh -huh. So you bring up an interesting point when, when it's, when people do it as kind of a performative thing and say, oh, we need this. It, it does kind of ring hollow. It's not, you know, it, it's kind of odd, but um, I know my experience working with clients, if you've been in business for five, 10, 15 years, you already have core values. They may not be articulated, you know, they may not be something that you put struck any kind of structure around, but when we're talking about core values, we're really talking about the ways you expect each other to behave and treat each other and treat your customers and patients and, you know, relationships and all that stuff. So um, if they're behavioral in nature, you already have expectations and of, of, you know, the team does of each other. So I just want to call the point of, you know, if somebody's listening to this and they don't have them written down and all, you that's an exercise of discovery not invention okay and what we kind of went that, through that together um with your business but it's like what what do you expect from each other and then the counter the other side of that coin 
is what offends you. Because the things that like drive you nuts, frustrate you, offend you are actually uh, probably violations of your core values. And that's revealing as well. So thanks for bringing that up. That's, um, you've done a great job with yours. Um, you wanna share a little bit of the kind of the feedback you've gotten in hiring people or bringing them on or your staff? <laughs> Well, I, th yeah. I think some of those stories yeah. are really interesting and, and uh, you know, bring it home because this isn't just touchy feely. I should do it because it's, you know, it's the right thing to do. Th these actually pay off in a, in a real business sense. Absolutely. They pay off. And, and one of the first payoffs was um, I actually ended up um, letting one of my therapists go. Okay. And it wasn't until you and I kind of really hounded home and, and worked and developed my core values did I realize that that individual wasn't aligned. And it, and it just, it was like a light bulb for me because mm -hmm. it was, well, no wonder there's so much friction here. No wonder this feels like just right. such hard work. It's because we're, we're two really great people in a situation and we aren't fitting together. And, and it came down to, to a value thing and, and, you know, even, yeah. So that was, that was one of the things that was the earlier, one of the earlier things. Right. Um, so that was really powerful. And all of a sudden it, and having those core values validated what I was feeling as well. And that was mm. powerful, right? It's kind of like, well, no wonder when this happens, you know, that upsets you or no wonder, you know, that type of um, personality characteristic causes some friction, right? Because it's kind of like, right. oh yeah. And, and you're right, they, they were there, but until I articulated and put them on paper, they, they didn't really seem real. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's a great way to put it. They don't, they're a little too abstract until they're written down. Right. And then yeah. once they're there and you start using them to make decisions and you know, in your hiring process or in yeah. uh, you know, figuring out fit with current staff, um, yeah, it feels a little abstract. I thought, cool, thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. So what's one of the and biggest- then, um, just go, oh, go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah, but wait, there's more. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> it's like an infomercial here. <laughs> But wait, sturdy. There's more. We have a ton of stories um, around my, this, but yeah, I'd love to hear. <laughs> my my most recent hire of a therapist coming in, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, I had met her on the phone. She had actually met with um, some of my other team members before I got to meet her one on one, and and so she had a little bit of exposure to us by then. But I hadn't had any exposure to her, or mm -hmm. or not as much. And so I, I think I emailed her our core values and then I had them printed and I, and I kind of opened the job interview with, here's our core values. I know you've seen them before. Um, and, and we discussed them a little bit. And then um, my, the interview process was all looking for behaviors that supported my core values and how she fit into those. And um, then we agreed and she came to work for us and about 10 days into her job um, during the onboarding process, we had a, we had a piece on the, on the core values again. And I said, so what's it, what's it like? What's it, do you see these? She says, you know, I just have to say that when I went home from that, that interview with you where, where we discussed the core values the very first time she says, I just looked at those values and they aligned nicely with me. And I just thought, I just think with those core values, I can be a better person. <laughs> and she says, I just want to be a better person. And I really, really want to work there. And then, and so we had a good laugh in that. And that was a really powerful moment for me as an employer and kind of like, okay, I think I made a good choice here for one, but also just again, validation of those core values. And then she said, you know, and then I went back into my old workplace and it wasn't a good fit for me. It was a little bit toxic. And you know, that I want to be a better person. I want to live by core values only lasted a couple of days as, as over there, old, over there. So, um, yeah. yeah. And then that made me think, you know, when you don't have the right person aligned with your values working in your system, not only is it a good fit for you, but, um, 
you're not a good fit for them either and they've got to feel it too right uh, that's an important point too because when i'm doing talks or training and stuff around how to recruit and hire a players people start thinking they're competing for the same a player but if you're if part of that equation isn't just that they're skilled and can you know hit the ball or run fast or whatever the job tasks are i'm using the athletic analogies now but um but if they're not aligned with your core values it doesn't matter how good they are at the skill set they're not going to fit well on the team right. you know and but somebody else with a different set of values you know will that that's their a player but maybe it's not yours or vice versa you know yeah. and uh yeah that's a that's a great point so cool thank you for sharing that um so tell us this what's one of the biggest things you've learned kind of recently that you wish you had known you know five ten years ago before you started your business well we can't go back that far right because five or ten years ago i didn't want to own a business remember <laughs> right <laughs> um, what do you wish you knew then <laughs> wish i knew then um I wish I had valued valued a really good fit, right? And that's and maybe that's what drove me into ownership as well, is because I mm -hmm. I just never felt that I really fit in, and and I found myself moving around a fair bit as a physio, um, and then so I think you know the value of honoring what what's important to you and finding that good fit. Um, so that's one thing for sure. And then the value as well, although I, I couldn't have done it when I first opened, but the value of asking for help and for that meant um, getting a coach and that that was you. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, thanks for picking I, me. <laughs> and thanks for picking me. <laughs> There's that good fit thing again, too, right? But I was even okay. talking to um, this week. I was talking to a, a a business owner, a young woman in our community, and she owns a gym, and and mm -hmm. and uh, and she's been in business for eight years, and she's we're you know every every appointment turns talking business, uh -huh. and. And I said, do you have a coach? And she says, well, I'm, I'm in a couple of groups now, but do you have a coach? And she says, no, but I've been thinking about it. And I thought, wow, here's someone who's been eight years mm -hmm. running her business. And I look at all of the gains that I made in the, in, you know, in the few short months with the coach compared to what I struggled to gain prior to that. And it's big value in that, so. Thanks. Yeah. I. It, it that's why I love doing it right um you get to help people kind of accelerate through but it's not it's for anybody listening it's not atypical for you know I, I get inquiries and talk to people that have been 15 20 years in business and never had a coach and maybe they've had um you know somebody they could talk to or a friend or a group that they joined or something like that but um that was an epiphany for me too you know going back 10 plus years ago, my, my first coaching experiences on the other side were really valuable, you know, and that's a big part. And, and this was a whole, a job I didn't even know existed. And if you go back 20 years ago, I'm like, I, I didn't know there were business coaches, right? right. I, I mean, when I became an entrepreneur, I didn't know how to spell it, right? <laughs> so <laughs> so <there> were, <laughs> it gets kind of basic at some level, but then you know, you, you, you learn and, and uh, you know, that opened up the doors for me to kind of see, oh, this is a, you know, a thing that I benefited from greatly. And, uh, and, you know, as I learned more about business, it was something I started exploring and getting involved in and really, um, you know, it's fun to help people, but you, to your point, you've got to find the right fit, you know, and that doesn't just mean somebody who's been in your industry before. You've got to find somebody who shares kind of not just a communication style, but but those values as well. Right. Um, yeah, you want to have a great experience with it. Um, so cool. Uh, so what, I mean, I find that successful people are always learning and growing. So what's a favorite business book or article or something that you're currently reading or that you have, you know, in the past that's really valuable? 
Um, well, me and reading, we've never really been good friends. <laughs> okay. Well, there's <laughs> for one books. thing. Okay. Um, and so when uh, I got myself into um, into a clinic owners group, uh -huh. and and at that point it was kind of like, what are you reading? What are you reading? And I'm all, what? I should be reading stuff. <laughs> and so I got introduced <laughs> to that, but um, I was quickly frustrated. And like I said, it's partly because I'm, I'm not a huge reader, but I quickly got frustrated because I get partway through a book and I'd say, well, this doesn't apply to me and this doesn't apply mm. to me. And this, you know, when I was a one man, one person show at the time, right? Right. And so, so I got frustrated with that. Um, but because I was supposed to be reading, because you're a business owner, you're supposed to read books, um, <laughs> continue, to, continue to, you know, uh, my, my library of half-read books is quite vast. Um, but it wasn't until, oh, maybe a couple of years ago, maybe not quite that long ago, that uh, it was in one of our meetings, or you brought up, maybe it was on a uh, post as well, and it says, like, what book are you reading? And what did you implement from it? Right. And I went, oh, that's why this stuff isn't helping me. <laughs> because I'm finding excuses and reasons not to implement things rather than finding, trying to find ways to make them work for my situation. Right. Um, so I should really go back to all of those books and reread them and say, okay, what are the one or two nuggets that I can pull out of each book and, and go from there? And well, then that's, start actually implementing them. That's a huge point, though, because if you, what was it? I think Alan Fine is the one who said it. But if reading the book was enough, we'd all be champions. Truly. <laughs> and right, and um, and it's not right. You've got to implement. You got to do something with it. So if you're reading a ton of books and you're not applying them or taking things that do could work and benefit your business, then um, you know, th think about that. Slow. You don't. It's not the volume or the quantity that you read either, by the way. You know, it's finding a couple of good things. Um, there's one right behind me here, Simple Numbers, Greg Crabtree. That's one of the ones <clears throat> I wish I had read 10 years before I did or 15 years before I did um, because he makes the whole financial thing really simple and straightforward um, and gives you some framework and rules and things that he's experienced and seen as a CPA and entrepreneur and consultant and author and teacher and, and, and a you know, a ton of stuff, but <clears throat> that's really where part of the pillar three in my pr program, the profit first budget comes from, is you got three buckets. And like that was in a, I don't know, kind of an epiphany. A lot of the stuff I read in the book, I had learned along the way, but um, he of course organized it better and I made me a convert, but it was, um, you know, you learn a lot of stuff the hard way or you can go to somebody who's done it before, who specializes and look at it and go, oh, what if I implemented the way he sets up a budget, right, with three buckets, really simple, and, you know, and set targets, by the way, right, and then look at that compared to what I've got. So whatever, you know, you guys who are listening or reading or doing, you know, do, do something with it. That's the, cool. that's a huge point, Linda. Yeah. Um, you've got to do yeah. something with it. Cool. And I find too with with um, with reading and whatnot, it it certainly comes in phases, um, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like there's a, there's a point where, you know, I was I was trying to devour as much as I could, and then it's just I don't know if it was burnout or you just kind of get into another type of steady state or something. But mm -hmm. um, it's interesting too. I've always said that life is all timing. And, and the, I think that's true when it comes down to books too, because I recently picked up a book by um, Elizabeth Gilbert called Big Magic. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had that sitting on my shelf for um, the better part of a year. Um, but it wasn't until just about 10 days ago that I said, no, actually, I think I'm ready to pick that one up and start working through that one. Cool. So had you tried or read part of it before? I had, yeah. Mm -hmm. It yeah. didn't quite click or? Yeah, it didn't quite resonate at the time. And then um, I think it's because um, from a personal perspective, it's um, not only has uh, 2020 brought a, a pandemic for me, but um, I lost my brother this summer too yeah. um, to cancer. And, and so 
when you're trying yeah. to survive and when you're trying to survive through a pandemic and then and then profound grief is thrown in on top of the mix too there's you know it it um now it's kind of i've worked through a little bit of that enough to say okay i think i'm actually ready to pursue some of the stuff that's been circling around my head for a while and um, and so that's that timing thing right i kind of had to work through a few things and get you know a really solid team at the clinic behind me um so that i'm now supported and um, ready to to move forward with some of these other things yeah i'm still so sorry about that you know yeah. um a really rough time for you on top of everything else so yeah um you mentioned timing on a little bit lighter note that that for me is moby dick i've read the beginning of that book in the first couple chapters i've made it through like maybe 10 times now <laughs> i've never finished the book <laughs> I just you're very can't. persistent <laughs> It's a classic. You're supposed to like it. There's so many lessons in it, right? And then, I, yeah, I just never, I get stuck every time. And I'm not sure, quite sure what it is, but I've gotten farther, but still, it's, it's sitting around here somewhere. Um, <laughs> maybe when I'm in my 70s or 80s, maybe. I'll like suddenly yeah. be like, oh, this is wonderful. Oh, there it is. <laughs> There's that fit. Hey, we have to fit with the right authors, too. Yeah. And I love, yeah, anyway, I, I can't make it through it. Um, so any other thoughts you want to leave us with before we wind down here? Any other ideas or lessons oh. for owners? Yeah, I think, you know, and, and it comes back to just the first few nuggets that I've pulled from this big magic book. It's kind of like, um, you know, we can move forward living from a place of fear and find all the reasons that we don't, that we should not do X, Y, or Z, you know. Um, but um, being able to look a little bit more through things with a sense of curiosity is, is certainly where I'm at right now anyway, rather than um, being held back by fear. And sometimes, as my sister always says, sometimes you just got to ask yourself, what's the worst thing that can happen? It's kind of like, yeah, if you're facing fear or if fear is holding you back from it, it's kind of like, what is the worst thing that can happen? And mm -hmm. maybe it's not that bad. <laughs> and... <laughs> That's a but... great filter, a great question to ask. So yeah. thanks for that, yeah. too. Very yeah. cool. Well, thanks so much for agreeing to do this and uh, sharing your story. Um, you know, as an entrepreneur, I'm uh, very excited for you and what's coming next. A reluctant entrepreneur, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but that's such but... an important deal, too, because, you know, there are going to be people who relate to every aspect of what you shared. Yeah. You know, and uh, I mean, that's Gerber's whole thing in the e-myth. Most entrepreneurs are kind of have a have what he calls an entrepreneurial seizure. I think of it as like a temper tantrum. Some, at least that's how I, I that's how it happened with me. It was kind of like, I'm going to go do this by myself. You know, I feel like I look back at that and go, I was a 30 year old toddler or something, you know, marching out to do it on my own. Um, so that's always, uh, yeah, I, I don't think that's abnormal at all. Yeah. So thanks for sharing. Anyway, thanks. As always, Dirty, a pleasure. Thanks. Okay.